Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Francis E. Walter, Democrat from Pennsylvania and Chairman of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Operation Abolition. This is what the Communists call their current drive to destroy the House Committee on Un-American Activities to, and to render sterile the security laws of our government. The Communist Party has given top priority to Operation Abolition and has assigned agents, trained, and agitation to this project. The scenes which you uh, will be viewing were taken by newsreel photographers during hearings of the Committee on Un-American Activities in San Francisco, California on May the 12th, 13th, and 14th, 1960. During the next few minutes, you will see revealed uh, the long time classic communist tactic in which a relatively few well-trained hardcore communist agents are able to incite and use non-communist sympathizers to perform the dirty work of the Communist Party. You will see uh, Archie Brown, the second in command of the Communist Party in California, Harry Bridges, an international communist agent and leader of the International Longshoremen's Union, who recently returned from conferences held with other leaders of communist-led longshoremen's groups. Ralph Isard, one of the top communist propagandists, who was a welcome guest of the Red Chinese government while American soldiers were giving their lives in the Korean War. You will see Douglas uh, Wachter, an agent trained to specialize in youth activities, William Mandel, another communist propagandist who serves the conspiracy in the fields of radio and television. Bertram uh, Edises, who is one of the elite corps of communist lawyers. Frank Wilkinson, recently convicted of contempt of Congress, who is in charge of the Citizens Committee to Preserve American Freedom the West Coast headquarters of the Operation Abolition. You will see these and others in action and the shocking technique which they use to incite others to violence. We are all too familiar with the pattern of communist-led revolution and rioting in Venezuela, Cuba, and more recently in Japan. Can it happen here on American soil? This film showing communism in action will answer that question. This is City Hall in San Francisco, the site of hearings held by the House with respect to the general operation of the communist conspiracy, wherever it may lead. Uh, in date, that law has been on the books for probably over 20 years. We receive our appropriations and are ordered every year to maintain this general surveillance uh, of the communist operations with the view of amending, improving, correcting uh, laws having to do with our internal security. The Internal Security Act of 1950, Foreign Agents Registration Act, the Smith Act, uh, and so on. This is part and parcel of our general studies of the machinations of the communist conspiracy. The communist apparatus activated its trained agitators and propagandists in the San Francisco Bay Area months before the scheduled hearings were to begin. The carefully organized protest campaign was climaxed with a student directive published just prior to the hearings on the front page of the official University of California student newspaper, The Daily Californian. The directive reads as follows. The Student Committee for Civil Liberties plans to picket the hearings today it has issued a call for students to attend the rally and hearings and suggests that people laugh out loud in the hearings when things get ridiculous. That is the end of the quote. Among the communist leaders who had an active part in the San Francisco abolition campaign and the protest demonstrations were Harry Bridges, whom you see here being escorted out of City Hall by police officials moments before the rioting broke out. 
Archie Brown, another longshoreman, played a major role in inciting the demonstrations against the committee. He is identified as the number two man in the California Communist Party and, admittedly, has been a party member for some 20 years. In the course of the three days of the hearings, Archie Brown had to be ejected from the hearing room on three separate occasions. Archie Brown was active in distributing propaganda pamphlets outside of the City Hall building. He had been subpoenaed by the committee as a witness. Another top communist agitator, also subpoenaed as a witness, was Merle Brodsky, whom you see here participating in the chanting and singing demonstrations immediately outside the hearing room. Merle Brodsky was ejected from the hearing room on two separate occasions for leading demonstrations while the committee was receiving testimony. Young Douglas Wachter, another Communist Party member, played an important role in the student riots. A sophomore at the University of California, Douglas Wachter was a delegate, together with his father, Saul Wachter, to the 17th National Convention of the Communist Party in December of 1959. The opening day of the hearings, Thursday, May 12, finds City Hall almost completely surrounded by picketers protesting the committee's appearance. Inside the building, the committee has reserved the largest hearing room in the city with a seating capacity of over 400 to accommodate an anticipated crowd. Upon request, the committee has issued nearly 100 passes to individuals representing various patriotic and religious groups, and the remainder of the chambers is filled with students, longshoremen, and the wives and relatives of subpoenaed witnesses. Officials admit spectators to the room's capacity while others are asked to remain outside until vacancies occur. At this point, professional communist agitators in the halls begin leading the crowd in chants and songs while the committee attempts to conduct its proceedings inside. During the morning session, the student contingent, together with subpoenaed communists, succeeded in disrupting the committee hearings time and time again. Shortly after 11 o'clock, Chairman Willis is forced to ask police to eject Archie Brown, several students, and Merle Brodsky from the hearing room. Mr. Chairman, you want in here? This is, this is part of this whole vicious witch hunt. Douglas Wachter is called to the stand and interrogated by staff director Richard Ahrens. He is asked about his Communist Party membership and his activities as a communist in various phases of college life. I respectfully object to the question on the same ground. Any question as to my political beliefs, belief, association statements deprive me of the right of free speech, press, assembly, and petition. The House on American Activities Committee serves no real legislative or constitutional purpose. It punishes individuals and You're reading from a prayer, prayer of speech. You're reading from a prepared statement. That's all right. Let him ask the question. Uh, could you continue reading it, please. It punishes individuals and groups for their politi political ideas and associations through public exposure well, now, and condemnation. Uh, now, I'm sorry. Uh, you are refusing to answer on the basis of the first amendment. Is that correct? I have, re I, I have objected to the question. It punishes individuals and groups for their political ideas and associations through public exposure and condemnation, often resulting in economic sanction. I cannot cooperate with the committee in answering any such questions. I feel I have an obligation as, as a citizen of this country to preserve the Constitution, and I do not feel I can do so in good conscience by allow, allowing the House and American Activities Committee to inquire into my beliefs or association. Mr. Wachter has not at this point invoked provisions against self-incrimination of the Fifth Amendment. He is ordered and directed to answer a question concerning his Communist Party membership. 
I decline to answer that question on the grounds previously stated, and I also respectfully refuse to answer that question on the constitutional grounds that I cannot be forced to bear witness against myself. During the noon luncheon recess, a protest rally in Union Square attracts nearly a thousand students and spectators. They listen intently as two San Francisco assemblymen and a prominent clergyman unleash bitter attacks against the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The rally is designed to incite further resentment against the committee and to recruit more volunteers for action. The rally accomplishes its major objectives for during the afternoon session, hundreds of additional students crowd into the corridors of City Hall, attempting to gain entry to the already overcrowded hearing room. Students left outside the room step up their chanting and singing, turning the hallways of City Hall into complete chaos. Officials are unable to maintain order. Meanwhile, a group of subpoenaed communist witnesses have already begun a demonstration inside the hearing room as the committee prepares to hear the first testimony of the afternoon. Chairman Willis calls for order, but to no avail. And the members of Congress wait through the hostilities as a specially trained police squadron is called to the scene to attempt to restore order. From left to right, you see Communist Party members Ralph Izzard, Archie Brown, Salutarian Sweet, and Saul Wachter all especially trained in agitation and incitement to riot. Next witness is Eugene Hall. 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 Barbara Harlow, please resume the witness stand. We want a record witness. Next witness is Eugene Hall. Next witness is Eugene Hall. Open the doors. Open the doors. Open the doors. Open the doors.
Americanism. Watch this Americanism in action. Oh, watch this Americanism in action. Watch this Americanism. Oh, come on, boy. Oh, God. Upon request of Chairman Willis, policemen removed the resisting demonstrators from the hearing room. First, Archie Brown. Then, Ralph Izzard. Saul Wachter. Morris Graham. Merle Brodsky. Juanita Wheeler. And finally, Sally Aterian Sweet. Chairman Edwin Willis issues another call for law and order in the hearing room. That these hearings have been conducted in a dignified fashion. The only reason, the only earthly reason why uh, the people of the is not open is that in no courtroom in America are people allowed on the side aisle unless they order it. In no picture show or other public function are people allowed in the side aisle without uh, being ordered. That is the only reason why this thing has been brought about. We were very patient this morning. We will continue to be patient, but firm and decided. Now, uh, this thing was brought about by disorderly conduct this morning. On the second day of the hearings, Friday, May 13th, loudspeakers are set up across the street from City Hall in an attempt to alleviate the crowds trying to gain entrance to the hearing room. Nevertheless, hundreds of students, longshoremen, and spectators crowd into the City Hall building as picketers continue to demonstrate outside the building. Officials admit over 200 of the crowd to the hearing room until it is once again filled to capacity. you see Vincent Hallinan, progressive party candidate for the president of the United States in 1952, served a prison term from 1954 to 1956, and attorney for several of the communist witnesses called to testify at the hearings. As was the case on Thursday, several professional communist agitators and student leaders direct the activity of those waiting in the hallways. Chants and songs get louder, and defiance to police attempts to maintain order becomes more universal. Students enthusiastically join in on the refrains to the songs, abolish the committee, we shall not be moved, lyrics to which are lifted from the old communist people's songbook. Demonstrations in the hallways of City Hall become so loud that the judges in their chambers on the third floor are unable to continue court procedures. During the morning, the judges give orders to the sheriff and police officials to remove the demonstrators from City Hall immediately. As pamphlets continue to be distributed among the demonstrators, police officials once again warn the students and agitators involved that they must be quiet or the orders of the judges will be enforced. The police warnings are met with jeers and boos and renewed chanting and renewed singing. Finally, during the noon lunch and recess, the judges in their chambers give official orders now to remove the demonstrators from City Hall. When an attempt is made to carry out the order, the crowd responds by throwing shoes and jostling the police officers. When one officer warns that fire hoses will have to be used if the crowd does not disperse, the demonstrators become more and more unruly. One student provides the spark that touches off the violence when he leaps over a barricade, grabs a police officer's nightstick, and begins beating the officer over the head. As the mob surges forward to storm the doors, a police inspector orders that the fire hoses be turned on. 
At this point, leaders of the group give orders to resist police enforcement. The crowd, now in open defiance of law and order, begins singing once again, we shall not be moved. Riot squad police reinforcements arrive on the scene and are met by boos and jeers from the rioters. The communist agitators give new orders now to the students to sit down with their backs to the fire hoses and put their hands in their pockets after interlocking arms in what is described later by student newspapers as nonviolent resistance. Police enforcing judicial orders to remove the demonstrators from the building take the defiant students one by one by the feet and slide them down the wetted marble stairs of City Hall. On several occasions, the pattern of so-called non-violent resistance is broken openly by defiant students. Those who had defied the law are taken to waiting police wagons and are hurried off to police headquarters where they are booked on counts of disturbing the peace, inciting a riot, and resisting arrest. The communist and pro-communist press, of course, charge police brutality. Their press accounts of the rioting describe repeated incidents of policemen cruelly beating innocent students. The innocent, peaceful students, it is stated in these communist press accounts, were physically hurled down two stories of stairs, toppling head over heel, and landed unconscious at the bottom where they were picked up and thrown into the paddy wagon. These films, taken by newsmen on the scene and edited only to the point of removing repetition, show a clear example of the lack of respect for truth, which is common practice within the communist propaganda press. The Communist Party emerges from the riots with only a handful of its party members arrested and none injured. Four students suffer minor injuries. Eight policemen are injured to the point where they require hospitalization. seriously hurt, two suffering heart attacks, and three are treated for deep cuts. Here you see patrolman Frank Dunphy, aged 61, who suffered a stroke when he was knocked down by student agitators.
One of the communist professional agitators arrested is Vernon Bowne, who was, in 1954, among the notorious Louisville Seven, charged at that time with sedition, destruction of property, conspiring to destroy property to achieve a political end, and contempt of court. Douglas Wachter, the 19-year-old student leader, was another Communist Party member who was arrested. At the police station, the rebellious students appear to have lost a little of their blatant enthusiasm and defiance, for without the psychological stimulus of mass chanting and singing, the individual students seem somewhat conscious and ashamed of what they have done. No longer is there the air of defiance. The organized resistance has been changed into individual confusion. These young people have been duped into openly resisting and defying law enforcement, duped by a handful of communist agitators. Another congressman assigned to the subcommittee conducting hearings in San Francisco is Congressman August E. Johansson of Michigan. Congressman Johansson. The students whose activities you have just witnessed, whether they realize it or not, are, as I pointed out to them in San Francisco, toying with treason. They have been handpicked by the communists to do the dirty work of the communists. Perhaps this is the greatest danger of all. The pattern of communist revolution and insurrection throughout the world has been to indoctrinate and train dupes to carry the party directives into the field while the communists themselves remain in the shadows through a careful propaganda and smear campaign the communists are able to inject a few with the virus the disease spreads rapidly among their friends and associates and a so-called spontaneous movement suddenly takes form. From this point on, the communists are relatively free to sit on the sidelines, issue occasional directives, and watch as their desires and projects are fulfilled to the perfection of their wildest dreams. Among those arrested in the city hall at San Francisco were a few trained communist agents. The others were the unwitting dupes of the party who had, in the heat of chanting and singing, performed like puppets with the communists in control of the strings, even to the point of willfully and deliberately defying law and order. The communists have admittedly chosen the minds of our youth as a number one area for their insidious attack. You have seen the evidence of their success. My fellow citizens, what you have just seen and heard is a challenge not only to the patriotic youth of our nation, but to every citizen who is determined that we shall maintain